I had one situation years ago that is somewhat relevant to this, and it was uh, when I was going mining, and every penny we had mattered, a, and I needed my semi-truck, which I'd quit driving, other than the fact we were gonna go moving mining equipment again. And it needed the differential, needed to put bearings in it, and as it turned out, it had about a 16th inch backlash, maybe even closer to an eighth, but a lot of backlash. This area down in here, um, it was worn. There was a ridge you could see where a lot of the gear had been worn away and it was the same way on the pinion. There was a ridge there. Well, I took a die grinder with a slitting disc and I ground away all of that, fe um, feathered it into the wear pattern part. I did that so that the contact could be made closer. Now you will not pattern that so that it comes out perfect when you get done but you can pattern it reasonably. And it went back in the truck and kept on running. What I did though, which is part of what I, I wanna get more into mentioning here was after doing that, I wasn't gonna try and do the patterns to come up with backlash. And I really don't believe in that. You do your best you can to get the pinion depth for a good pattern. And then your backlash should be set with an indicator. Because if I was just gonna try and reset it to say uh, 330 seconds of an inch backlash where it was running, there'd have been no point in doing it. And leaving that much backlash, the pounding on the gear as it would run would tear it up. So what I did was I brought it back to about five thousandths of an inch backlash and then let the gear wear into having a nice matched pattern again. Or at least I think it did because it kept working. Um, and it wasn't noisy but I got more life out of it because I didn't have, while we were setting up to go mining, I didn't have the other $1,700 for a new ring and pinion for the truck. But I had, I think it was about 800 by the time I bought the bearings and then my time and um, we did what we could. Um, <clears throat> you can't go broke mining without spending money. And do you know how to make a small fortune mining? Start with a big one. We didn't have a big one, so we didn't make a fortune. Um, another thing here that I wanted to make a little bit more clear is, and part of why I really am excited on the whole idea of finding the location that your pinion fits, uh, preferably if you can do it out of a book numbers and set it up by pinion depth to start with, even if you're not close, you're not real close, even if you're using crude tools and get it somewhere in there because you can actually be off enough with the pinion depth, especially with a housing that's been torn up or reused gears that you've done things you weren't supposed to, to where your pattern is strictly a matter of a line right on the top of the gear and you don't see it at all. So you really get frustrated when you pattern it and there's nothing showing. It's driving the gear, but there's absolutely nothing showing. Um, so in those cases, if you are there already, then you're going to have to look in with a mirror, do your best, maybe put something between here, get some kind of an idea what's going on if you're at the point where the, uh, the uh, compound is not showing at all. But normally you're going to be too shallow because if you're too, de too deep, it would show somewhere down in here. You'd just be extremely too shallow. Um, something else that I was thinking about on the pattern... One thing is there's uh, another a video that besides linking to our first one talking about high point gears is uh, there's another one from a whole nother channel that I saw that had pretty good description of the actual pattern for the pinion depth. Um, there's on the market, I showed the tools earlier in this video that we use that I have used for years and they have a clamshell uh, puller set yet, which I don't have a picture of. It's two half rounds that go over the bearings and let you pull the bearings. And uh, those, while they showed up once or twice in books 40 years ago when I first started doing this stuff, they weren't readily available at a good price. So I just bought a set off Amazon for a hundred bucks. And that's, uh, that's, I think, a reasonable investment. You might pick one of the other sets that's 200 or 300, whatever you find. Um, but they seem to all get about the same reviews. They look like they're all made in China or India, whether they're whoever put their brand on, they look the same. I could be wrong. Um, what you may do sometimes too, I've done lots of times on a uh, rear axle, you'll find that the carrier has got 
a little bit of play to it, but the pinion seems to be good. Generally, things are running running okay, but the, the uh, carrier, the side bearings, are just, uh, you got an uh, extra 10 or 15 thousandths uh, movement to it, which is too much. And if you ignore it, it will tear up the axle, but you can go ahead and just add a little extra shims on those and tighten it up a little bit and leave the rest of it alone most of the time. And generally what I will do if I had 15 thousandths of clearance, I would be figuring that I should have about 20 that I put in there for shims so that I have a 5 thousandths preload. If they're new bearings, I generally will run 10 or 15 thousandths in a Dana 80 for the preload. That works out pretty good. But on used bearings, I don't want to preload them that tight because they've already worn together some and they don't take an extra preload as well. So I will generally look at a 5 thousandths preload to tighten them back up. And when I do that 20 thousandths, I will try and put it so that it's 5 thousandths on one side and 15 on the other. And I'll take up a little backlash usually too, depending on how it is. But usually the backlash is a little bit more uh, than what you really want at that point also. As I've looked at this again, besides what I've done over the years, watching other people on YouTube and stuff, I was mentioning on the, uh, the compound to look at your pattern. You get the best look at it with a thin, pat, thin uh, compound. Thin compound gives you a better look of the actual pattern. But again, if you're a long ways off, I started seeing, looking at several different people doing this. I've watched several hours of other people with their demonstrations on YouTube. And with the thicker compound that they usually give you, you have a little bit of a pattern that's not really a pattern. But because you can see the place where it might contact and then coming off of it, you see some slightly disturbed grease which they're normally counting as a pattern, even though it's not part of the pattern. But the fact that it's there gives you more of a visual indication of the direction to go, even though it's not showing you just the pattern. It's actually, they're showing a lot of times where it's got a very, very small pattern. It's, it's not because of how much it needs to move, but it looks bigger because they're using the thick compound. So while I spoke before being against the thick compound, it's a general precision thing. You don't get as precise of a view of what's going on, but it does have uh, some value in getting you and you got a long ways off, which you can be quite a bit off when you start out on a rear axle.